Go ahead. And I'm going to turn this here. Don't get too distracted by it, though. <clears throat> I got it color coded and everything there. So greens with green and blues with blue, reds with red, and then the blacks is the colors. So that'll give you something to look at as I talk about things. Because I'm not going to do as much, you know, exposition necessarily in this sermon as I am going to be kind of talking through different things. I'm going to go to scriptures and elaborate on them for sure, but it's not some hyper exegetical sermon. Uh, this is the second sermon in a series of sermons on the rapture, the doctrine of the rapture of the church that we got from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and you can go there if you want to. We're in 1 Thessalonians 4, we're going to start with verse 13, where the Bible reads, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also them, uh, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, and so last time I really went into just the basics. And I showed how in this passage... There is a consistent flow of the passage and some simple truths of the passage. Uh, it lays out very clearly for us. Number one, it says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now, again, simple truth, but did you know there's some people that even mess that one up? The Lord himself, it says, shall descend. Some people say, He done came. Some people say he came in judgment in 70 AD. They're called preterists. A lot of Presbyterians and Calvinists and Reformed people are uh, preterists. They're pre it's called preterism. Uh, they think it all happened already. Well, did the Lord himself come down? No, they say. They say he came in judgment. But you see how this passage says, for the Lord himself shall descend. Number two it says, with a, vo with a voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Number three, the dead in Christ rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. And then we are forever with the Lord. That in simplicity is the doctrine of the rapture. The word rapture I showed you last week comes from the words there in verse 17, caught up. Caught up means to be snatched or seized. And I think that that really is the best way of understanding what rapture means. In modern times, the word rapture has become meaning, you know, some ecstatic state or passionate uh, feeling, you know, you might have. You're caught up in rapture. But that's not really what rapture, rapture means to be seized or to be caught up, right? And so you can think of it as the catching up of the of the church. Literally, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says the uh the rapture of the church is in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, instantaneously snatched up. You're caught up in the air to meet the Lord where you're, you will forever be with the Lord. Now, these simple truths you wouldn't think would be debated, but as you're going to see here today and probably in the next sermon or however many it takes me to get through this at a, at a pace and uh, with clarity and depth that I want to, you're going to see that there's a lot of confusion on basically every point. Somebody somewhere has attacked almost every point of doctrine in the Bible. And in regards to what we call eschatology, that eschatology is a big word, but all it means is end times. So if I ever say eschatology, just know what I mean is end times. Uh, eschatos is a Greek word that means end or end times, right? And so all we're saying is end times theology, right? So eschatology means end times theology. And when it comes to the eschatology taught in the Bible, people attack it 
every way possible. They attack the millennial reign of Christ. They attack the coming of Christ. They attack the rapture of the church. They attack the timing of the rapture. Uh, they attack the nature of the millennial reign of Christ. They attack the judgment of Christ. They attack everything. And so in this series, we're going to be dealing mainly with the rapture of the church because that's what 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 18 have given us. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 18 is really, get this, the clearest, most definitive passage in all the Bible on the doctrine of the rapture. Going along and, and in tandem with 1 Corinthians 15, that talks about being caught up in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, those two passages essentially form for us the clear, unmistakable doctrine of what's known as the rapture or the rapture of the church. And this is, this is under attack by a lot of different people. And, you know, many people that I've talked to have had various levels of confusion on this. Myself included. Everybody's been confused on something at some point. And I know the different perspectives. Now, I'm not confused anymore. I understand the various perspectives. I've, I've chosen what I believe is the correct one. And if you can look at this board I have prepared here for you, you can get an idea of some of the various views of the timing of the rapture. And now the timing of the rapture is tied to the nature, the purpose, and the point of the rapture. That's a key. Okay? Just like the timing of the rapture during the tribulation is going to be tied to the purpose and the point of the tribulation. I hope I spelled tribulation correctly. I'm, I mean, that's my, best, that's my best way of doing it. But tribulation just means time of trouble or time of testing, right? The tribulation period is a seven-year period lined out for us in Daniel uh, chapter 9 where it talks about 70 weeks and there's one week left. A week is a seven. And there's one seven-year period that never was fulfilled. That never took place. That one seven year period. Remains to be fulfilled. And it is the one seven year period. We are all looking to. And saying that's it. When that happens it's the end. And there's different views based on the rapture. In regards to that final seven year period. Now this sermon. The first sermon rather. Was not designed to complicate things. Rather, it was designed to simplify and solidify what the Bible teaches. So that's why I went through. The Lord himself shall descend. You'll be caught up in the moment of twinkling of an eye. Those things aren't debatable. There's no question about those things. You understand that? There's not confusion. There shouldn't be confusion. There is, but there shouldn't be confusion by Christians whether the Lord himself shall descend, whether all Christians go, Paul plainly says, whether you're dead or whether you're alive, you're going in the rapture if you're saved. And that's why I made it clear last week, if you're a Christian, you're going in the rapture. Remember I talked about the partial rapture theorists who think that you've got to be extra good to get caught up in the rapture. It's not interpretive. And uh, I think, you know, the problem with most people's theology is that they never really think their theology through. They either get hand-me-down theology, like my mommy and daddy told me, or the church I always attended told me. They get that hand-me-down theology. They never go and search the Bible themselves for their theology. And there has to come a time when what you believe goes from what someone else told you to what you found. And it becomes your own. You ever, you ever seen somebody say, well, when they say it, they say it like they believe it. When they say it, they say it like they mean it. It's This person believes what they say. And some people can fake that, by the way. But some people are genuine with that. But are you that person? When you talk about the Bible or you talk about the things of God, do you speak with conviction? And the thing that might separate you say, well, why don't I speak with conviction? Why don't I get passionate about it? Why is it not so that I'm interested in like that? It might be because you've never went to the Bible, studied it yourself, and found the power of the Word of God. Because there's power in this book. And when you find a doctrine in the Bible, and you see it clearly taught in the Bible, you now have authority and clarity to say, this is what God says. As opposed to, if I just tell you, you're like, well, Charles told me that. 
You know what I'm saying? And even if I'm telling you based off what I found in the Bible, you have to gain that conviction yourself from the Bible. And so that's why a lot of people are confused. They have hand-me-down theology, and worse than that, they have theology that's wrong that was handed down. And so you have to study these things for yourself, and a lot of people just quite simply do not do that. What they do, you say, well, what, you know, we're going to speak in blanket terms, obviously, but what do most Christians do with the Bible? Well, I'll tell you what they do. They get one verse, maybe two. And they understand that one or two verse. For some people, if you don't work, you don't. You shouldn't eat. You know, For another person, uh, you, know, you don't take care of your own, you're worse than an infidel. For a lot of people, judge not. You know, judge not, that's their verse. You know, depending on who you are or where you're from, you know, someone who claims Christianity might have one verse that they're going to go to. Now, take that a step further. A lot of Christians, when it comes to a doctrine in the Bible, they got one verse for what doctrine they believe. So, we talked a lot in Sunday school this morning about doctrines that are red flags to show you this person might not be saved if they believe this. And one of those red flags we ain't got to yet is, can you lose your salvation? And somebody who might think that you can lose your salvation, which I believe is a heresy, and does indicate you're probably not saved, one of those, red, one of those uh, uh, th verses they might use might be like Hebrews chapter 6. It's impossible to, to you know, bring someone into repentance that's once been enlightened. I'm paraphrasing that. They might use that one verse and say, you can lose your salvation because that one verse. But guess what? If you sat down and talked Bible with that person, they wouldn't be able to tell you nothing else in the Bible. They wouldn't be able to tell you what, what the Trinity was. They wouldn't be able to tell you what Genesis taught. They know one verse in Hebrews 6, and they don't know nothing else. And so, <clears throat> when we talk about eschatology, the, the study of the end times, what I believe the biggest problem is, is people don't have an understanding of what the whole Bible teaches. But people ain't going, oh, you know, okay, I'm reading the whole Bible. Now I have a view of theology. People are getting, somebody told them this, and they know this one verse, and then they form a view based off that. And that's just simply, that's not good. That's, that's not sound, and that's not going to lead you to truth. And most certainly, let's just say somebody told you the truth. And you never studied it for yourself. Well, now you got the truth, but you ain't got conviction. And if you don't have conviction of that truth, if you didn't study that truth for yourself, and someone just told you the truth, if none of you guys know anything this morning that I teach you, I can teach it to you, but you're not going to have conviction about it. It's not going to lead you to do anything that the Bible says it will make you to do, which I'll get into at some point too. What does good theology do for you in regards to the rapture? It purifies you, the Bible says. Every man who has this hope in himself purifies himself, the Bible says. There's blessings that come with it. Well, can you partake of that blessing if you just have hand-me-down theology? You're not coming to that conclusion and conviction yourself in Scripture? Maybe, but it, not be, it won't be as good. And um, I'm going to try to give you an illustration here. I think many uh, prophetic, as they call it, theories on the millennial reign of Christ, um, they're taken with total disregard to a number of clear scriptures and all the clear uh, prophecies on the millennial kingdom and really the actual description of the kingdom. How, how can you, you get there? How can someone develop a view of the millennium that says there isn't a millennium, for example. How can you get there? When the Bible has hundreds of times that it speaks about this. And the answer is, they have a systematic that's driving their theology, not Bible that's driving it. So they have their conclusion on what they think the Bible teaches. And so they, they state their conclusion, they find a verse that seems to agree with it somewhere... And they ignore the rest of the Bible to teach it. That's how you get all millennialism, for example. And what happens is they wind up creating uh, errors in the Bible when you do this. When you do this, you create errors in the Bible. If you tell me you can lose your salvation based off Hebrews 6 or something, well, guess what? You just contradicted like a hundred verses that talk about 
eternal life, drinking of the water of life freely and never thirsting again. Uh oh, I'm thirsty again. I lost my salvation. Makes no sense. You just created tons of problems based off of one bad interpretation. The Bible says this in 2 Timothy 2.15. You need to study to show you thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, it is orthodox. It's correct. It's God glorifying. It's God believing. To view the Bible as consistent and true. What it says here, it agrees here. What it says there, it agrees over here. Everything goes consistently together. And when you find inconsistency, you find an error. So, try to follow along with what I'm saying here. When you get to these different views of the rapture, when you find inconsistency, when you find something that says, ah, how do you reconcile that with this? And there's no good way of doing it. Or when you find something over here that says, wow, that really seems like it leads you to believe this, then you know it, it's taken to a place of either fact or fiction or truth or error. Genesis doesn't say one thing about creation and then here came Jesus in the Gospels and he taught evolutionary theory. You see what I'm saying? In Genesis, remember we talked about this morning, he created through speaking. He created it instantaneously with a word. And God created it all. And he made man on the sixth day. And he made man out of the dirt. And he made woman out of the man. But what if in you know, Matthew, Jesus taught evolution? You'd say the two don't go together. And they don't. And Jesus didn't teach evolution, by the way. But you see, what I'm showing you is this. You can't take a view that Scripture here says something radically different than over here. And I propose to you that a lot of eschatologies, a lot of people's belief in the Bible does that very thing. But they don't know it. You say, well, why don't they know it? Because they don't know the Bible. Mainly, they don't know the Old Testament. Now, I don't know if you guys, I'm, I'm deviating from my notes, which is a dangerous thing. I could go on a long-winded rant. And uh, never come back and it would be all over the place. But I, I want to explain this in brief. Maybe you don't understand this. The Old Testament is the foundation for the New Testament. Okay? If we don't have an Old Testament, we don't have a New Testament. And just like that, if what we know in the New Testament contradicts the Old Testament, the New Testament... Or the Old Testament, one of the two is a lie. You understand that? And now this is what Jews believe, by the way. You ever wonder what a Jew believes? Or a Jew, uh, an Orthodox Jew? Well, we know that, as John says, Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. Right? The Jews rejected Jesus. The Jews say, they said to Jesus, you're not the Messiah. You know, your father's the devil. You're a child out of wedlock. They were blaspheming Jesus and denying Jesus. But they claimed to believe the Old Testament. And what did Jesus, what did the apostles, and what did every Christian since then say to a Jew? Did they say, the Old Testament's wrong? No. They said, the Old Testament points to Jesus. And we can prove that. Go to Isaiah 53. And so, the New Testament is built on the Old Testament. Why do people's eschatology... Why, do, why is it so radically wrong? I believe most of the time it's out of ignorance of the Old Testament. And in the same way, we know Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He's the second person of the Trinity. He is God in the flesh. He is the only Savior. He's the only mediator between God and men. We know that definitively from the Word of God, from the New Testament, and from the Old Testament. The same way we know that, we know how God's going to end all things. And we find a lot of that in the Old Testament. And people's ignorance of the Old Testament leads, this down, leads them down this road where they land in strange and, and bizarre places. Another example for you. We did a study in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And hopefully you remember some of that, right? We studied and seen how Russia and Iran and some of those Arab nations are going to attack the nation of Israel. And if you notice within that prophecy... 
And if you read the prior chapters, 36, 37, you know what you read? You read of a time when Israel would be restored to the land. And it doesn't just say Israel. It says Judah, Jerusalem, you know, Jacob. It says Israel, you know, as many ways possible. And it says they're going to be restored to the land. And they're going to be a nation again. And they're not longer going to be two. They're going to be one. And they're no longer going to be in idolatry, but they're always going to be saved and walk in fellowship with the Lord. Now, has that happened yet? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And so, how do you get to a point as a Christian, and there's a lot of them, as a preacher, and there's a lot of them, how do you get to the point where you say there's no future for Israel? That they won't be regathered in the land. That the two nations won't be one. That they would be scattered but gathered. That they would not be in idolatry but be saved. How can you say God's done with them? You don't know what the Old Testament says. And this goes with everything I'm trying to kind of get out there as a foundation for this study. Because it's huge. If you don't understand, you can't just take one verse and nullify all the Bible with a bizarre, strange interpretation, then you're never going to get your theology right. Now, remember this morning how I said, it don't matter, you can be off on something and still be saved. So, saved people are off on the doctrine of the end times. This is saved people. I'm not saying everybody's unsaved if they don't agree with it. I'm saying, if you study the Word, the Word will lead you to the truth, and eventually... The cobwebs in your head and the, the darkness, the fog that's blocking your vision of the clear word of God. Eventually, you'll be able to see these things clearly. There must be, uh, as our presupposition they call it, you're supposing beforehand. There must be, as our presupposition, the fact that the Bible is perfect and without error. The fact that the Bible is consistent in what it says. So, this is why, by the way, because some people that know me know my position and know where I've stood on all this and all this kind of thing. I, my, my throat's killing me. I got to do this. I don't know what's going on. It's something with the air in here. It's like, I, that's why I drink water. If you remember, I preached probably hundreds of times or something by now. Like, I never used to drink water that much during preaching. There's something in the air in here that makes my throat dry out or something. I don't know what it is. But anyways, this is why, why people. You say, how could somebody believe one thing about the rapture, like I used to, and then change my mind? We know when I first come here, true story, when I first come here, I sat down with Jack. And Jack was wanting me to preach here and stuff. He said, you know, I'm leaving half the year. I want you to take over. I want you to preach most of the services. And you know, I was telling him what I wanted that to look like and what I thought was right, and we was talking theology. You know, I told Jack, I said, Jack, I, I just, I'm not a pre-trib rapture believer. I don't believe in the pre-trib rapture right now. I don't understand where they're coming from. And we talked about it a lot. And, we, you know, that's something we talked about at length, but he said, that's okay. But, you know, now, I believe the pre-trib rapture is probably the true view of the rapture. But I didn't used to believe that. And so somebody would say, how can you change your mind? How can you say, oh, you're teaching the Bible and you change your mind on that? How can you say this person's wrong on that? How can there be confusion on that? If you've been following what I'm saying, you understand why. This is why that happens. This is why people can change their view on eschatology so much. Now, the nature and character of God, the way of salvation, those things are so crystal clear. Those things are, are not even hard to discern. But there are some things... Like uh, Peter talked about with Paul, that are hard to understand. And eschatology is one of those. And so as, there's, as a person's study of the Bible deepens, as you more and more understand the Old Testament, as you more and more understand the systematic teaching of, of what the Bible says about Israel and what the Bible says about the end times, then you further develop and you put these pieces together. Uh, think of it like this. Now, I'm giving a lot of illustrations, but I'm trying my best to get this in your, in your head and understand the, the way to understand these things uh, foundationally. Think of it like this. If you, if you, you know how Luke likes to make puzzles, okay? So imagine Luke has a 100-piece puzzle. 
And, you know, a pitcher might have a tiger, a lion, and a giraffe in it. Well, let's say you get a pitcher, a part of that puzzle is done, right? And it's grass. That's all you got. Luke started a puzzle, and he just got the grass. You'd look at that, and you'd say, that's a field. So you just say, that's grass. Then somebody else would say, uh, you're not done yet. There's jagged pieces there. There's something wrong in this picture. And so you keep going. And then you get a tiger. And then you get a lion. And then you get a half of a giraffe. And you say, well, what do you see? You ain't going to say you see a field. You're going to say, I see some animals. And so that's what I'm saying. When you're putting the pieces of the Bible's teaching on eschatology together, you're, you're slowly forming this bigger picture that over time you can more clearly see. Now, some of these people, they just hurry up and form half like half a face of a tiger, and it's like some weird, like stupid looking picture, and they say they're done. Oh, look, I'm done. It's, it's a half of a tiger's eye. You know, it's all millennialism. And you're sitting here saying, there's, there's all these pieces of a puzzle left. What on earth? Oh, it's a, it's a phone. I was like, I was like, the rapture's happening. <laughs> no, uh, there's, a, there's some kind of sound. But there's all these pieces of a puzzle left. And if you have 100 puzzle pieces and you're only using three, you're probably not done. But that's what people do with the, with the doctrine of end times. The all millennialists and the replacement theologians, they got three verses, right? Three verses out of 100. And they say, these three verses teach us all we need to know on the end times in Israel and eschatology. Well, hold on a second. There's 97 more. You see, you want the whole picture. You want all the puzzle pieces to go into that and to form that picture. And I think that that's why. Understand, that's why this could be so hard to understand. But my, my desire isn't that I confuse you with these things. Because I'm getting ready to get into all these different theories and all this. My desire, rather is to show you where the theories are coming from, what they try to say, show you why I think they're wrong or right. Um, show you the strengths and or weaknesses, supposedly, of these views. Show you what these people might argue. So my goal is to educate you. Now I'm going to tell you what I believe is true. I'm going to tell you why I believe it's true. And hopefully on that journey, you'll see, oh, okay, you know, I agree with Charles. Or, you know, for some reason you might say, I, I disagree, and we can, you know, talk about that. But you'll at least learn. And so the goal with, with this sermon and the next sermon is going to be that you learn, that you understand more clearly these different perspectives, and most importantly, why they're wrong or why the right one's right. So I'm going to give a view. I'm going to give the arguments for it or against it. And like I said, the sermon is going to be intended to be informative and, as they call it, polemical. That's a big word, too. But I'm going to argue against the, the error. So first here, if you look, what color did I give it? What's that last color over there? Red? I can't hardly see it. Red, red. Yeah, post-trib is red. So first, I'm going to go through the post-tribulational view of the rapture. And you, you might be saying, what's post-trib, pre-trib, mid-trib? pre-wrath, what does all these things mean? Well, if you look up there on that board, I tried my best, to, it's squiggly, but I don't, I don't have a, a ruler or something to make my line straight. I couldn't find one in here. But you got a seven-year period known as the tribulation period. And within that seven-year period, three and a half years in, you have the abomination of desolation. I, I summarize it as AOD. That's when the Antichrist says, I'm God, worship me. And that's when the Jews reject him. At the beginning, they'd made a peace deal with him. Probably them. It says the many. And many, we think the many is Israel. So they make a peace deal with him at the beginning of the seven years. By three and a half years in, they break that peace deal. And then you got three and a half more years, and then you get to the end. And at the end of that seven-year period, this right here is where definitively, Without question, without interpretation, without any confusion or ability for anybody to argue, that is where Jesus returns to earth, sets down his feet on the Mount of Olives, and sets up his millennial kingdom. 
So what we're looking at is that seven years at the end, when is the rapture? When does the rapture happen? When are we caught up in a moment in a twinkling of an eye? When are we changed? When does this corruptible put on incorruptible, as the Bible would say? When do we meet him in the air and forever be with him? What is the timing of the rapture? And that's what we're going to talk about here now. So we got the facts of the rapture. We're going to be changed. A moment of twinkling of an eye. We're going to be forever with the Lord. The dead are first. We're not going to go before them. Those are just a clear, you know, can't argue that facts. But now when you get to the timing of the rapture, a lot of people are confused. <clears throat> and understandably so, it can be pretty complicated. Let me try to help you understand these views a little bit better, okay? The one view, that, the two views that I did not put up here are the mid-tribulation view. I'm not going to be talking about it. Why am I, why am I not going to be talking about the mid-trib view? Because it's stupid. Because it's stupid. The mid-trib view has no good reason to believe it at all. I, I even read a book one time on the views of the rapture. That book was about this thick, right? And had like, let's say, 200 pages. And the section where a guy argued for the mid-trib view was like three pages long. There's nothing there. The only thing you can say for the mid-trib view is a bunch of stuff happens at the, mid, at the midpoint. Okay. Yeah, it does. What does it have to do with the time of the rapture? So that's it. So that's all the time I'm giving that view. There's no good reason to believe it. Now, a view did spring up called the pre-wrath rapture, the post-tribulation pre-wrath rapture, which is a view I used to hold. That view sprang up, and that's one I will deal with. It's a modified view of the mid-trib view because it happens after the midpoint of the tribulation. I'll talk about that one second in this series. The first one I will talk about, though, is the post-tribulational rapture. This is the view. If you look at it up there, it's in red. I think it's in red, right? This is the view that says at the, at the end of the final seven-year period, known as the tribulation, that Christ will rapture His church to meet Him in the air, and then immediately... Prior to returning to heaven, continue his downward journey to earth and set up his kingdom. You see? Now, if you remember in the first sermon, you might already understand some problems with that. If not, I'll refresh your memory. Don't worry about it. But that is the view. I'll say it again just so you, in case you couldn't necessarily get it all at once. The post-trib view is the view that says at the final seven-year period known as the tribulation that Christ will rapture his church they will meet him in the air and then immediately come back down they will come down to, he uh, to earth they will not go to heaven they will come right back down to earth and Christ will set up his kingdom the, the people who argue for this view typically will say the following things this is something you might hear out of their mouth they will mock the rapture. You understand that? It's, it's strange, but listen, this is the truth. They will mock the rapture. People who hold to a post-tribulational view of the rapture mock the rapture. Nine times out of ten, from my experience, from my study, from reading their own writings, they mock the rapture. They will joke about how stupid and dumb the pre-trib view is where people vanish and, you know, they just, they're just disappearing and they ain't found anymore. They mock that and they make fun of that. And most of their attacks really just stem from unbelief. That's what it really is. They don't believe what the Bible plainly says. Because what did the Bible plainly say that we've already covered? That you're going to be caught up in the moment in a twinkling of an eye. Now, think about what a twinkling of an eye implies for a second. You, you know what that means? For you to go from where we're at right now... To way up in the sky, in a moment, you're going to basically vanish, right? But how many times have I heard these people make fun of, oh, you're going to vanish, and all this kind of, hey man, that's what the Bible teaches. 
You need to be careful sometimes. Some of these theological people, they need to be careful. They're, they're blaspheming God with some of the things they say. They're blaspheming his word when they make fun of the rapture and stuff. And these post-trib people, these pure I call them pure post-trib because there's this new view called the pre-wrath view where they have a different view of what the tribulation is. But these pure post-trib people, these people that think the rapture is just this, boop, boop, you know, up, up, down, this this quick little, you know, we, they say we, I uh, mentioned it last week, they say we're going to meet him like the Roman soldiers and the Roman civilians used to go meet the Roman army when they would when they would come back from battle. They go out to meet him and bring him back in. It's just theatrics. We're not going up for any reason. We're just going up there to say hi and then we come right back down. That is, that's something to be mocked because not only does it deny scripture, but it just, it's just silly. Why on earth? Why not just gather us over there to Mount Zion or, or to Mount of Olives rather. Why not just gather us over there? Why, why not just take us over there? Why bring us up in the air and float around for a second and then come right back down? The, the post-trib view like that makes really very little sense. Now, you say, well, do they use the Bible? Yeah, of course. They have, they have biblical arguments. Go to Matthew 24. And... It's important that you go through what I'm showing you right now because this overlaps with the pre-wrath view, okay? The pre-wrath rapture view, it, it kind of steals from elements of the post-trib view and the pre-trib view. That's what the pre-wrath view is. The pre-wrath view is a view that was designed to steal what they perceive to be the best aspects of the post-trib and the pre-trib, okay? And so... What I'm going to show you here out of Matthew 24 is going to be the same things I would show you for the pre-wrath view. And so I'm not going to do it again. That's why I'm saying it's, it's good to go through now and to see what I'm saying. So in Matthew 24, verse 29, the Bible reads, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This, in conjunction with, if you can turn over, good. If not, just listen. This uh, scripture in conjunction with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians 2, the first few verses read this way. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself uh, that he is God. And so, what they will say is this, okay? Number one, they will say, in Matthew 24, verse 29, They'll say, ah, oh, there it is. Okay, you read it there, I'll go back. Matthew 24, 29. There it is, they say. That's a rapture. You read it? Immediately after, they say. Underline it in your Bible. You know, after. This is their argument. Immediately after the tribulation, they say. There it is. It's done. It's the, How can you miss it? It's, it's not confusing. After the tribulation is when Jesus returns. Well... Isn't that what I just now said to you earlier right here? Didn't, didn't I say at the first that after the tribulation is when Jesus returns? Didn't I say that already? Yeah. So what, what do they need to prove out of this? They need to prove that this is the rapture, you see? But they are, again, it's simplicity and ignorance. It's assuming the point. It's not proving the point. What you have to prove is that that is the rapture. What you have to prove is that that actually is to the church. 
There's two things you've got to prove that they assume. They assume that he's not talking to Israel, that he's talking to the church. They assume that he's talking about the rapture and not his final second coming when he lands and touches down on the earth. Another thing is, in 2 Thessalonians 2, their second main argument, the second passage I read you, they'll say, the rapture can't happen. Right there it is, black and white. The rapture can't happen because these two things must take place, they say. First, the son of perdition, well, first, the, the falling away must happen, right? First, there must come a falling away. And second, the son of perdition must be revealed. And they'll say, huh, that ain't happened yet. That ain't happened at all. So therefore, we're waiting for those two things. That's the next things we're looking for, is the falling away and the man of sin being revealed. Therefore, the rapture ain't next. Here's their third argument, and the third main argument that they will use, in my view at least, and probably most of theirs, comes from Revelation chapter 20. Uh, a lot of you guys might not be familiar with this one. Revelation chapter 20. Here's another thing I've heard them say. Revelation 20 verses 4 and 5. Listen to what the word of God says. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Which had, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Listen to what it says. This is the first resurrection. Uh-oh. They'll say, see? It says the first resurrection. Therefore, how can you say the church was given new bodies during a rapture that happened seven years ago? And so they try to say, this is the first resurrection. Therefore, this must be the rapture or something like that. That is the three main arguments that people will typically give you for the post-tribulational view. Now, unfortunately, time is running out quickly. So what I'll try to do here, here for you really uh, in brief is introduce you. Uh, I'm not going to go over, so I'm just going to cut it slightly short and we'll pick back up with this this evening. Um, I'm going to expose you to why this is not true in brief, but I'll have to cover it in totality this evening. Uh, so hopefully you guys come back out this evening or else you might be persuaded of the post-trib view, I guess. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But uh, the two reasons why the, the post-tribulational view, I believe, has problems, you can break it down into two categories. And the first one is explicit scriptures that make the post-tribulational view impossible. There is explicit scripture that makes it impossible. And number two... There is implicit scripture. In other words, the scripture ain't necessarily making it impossible, but if you just read it, but if you if you understand what the scripture's teaching you, you'll say, there's no way that the post trib rapture is true. And I guess I can I can whet your appetite to one of those. Turn to Isaiah 65, verse 20. Or listen if you don't feel like turning. Isaiah uh, 65. Verse 20. You say, well, why would the post-trib rapture be impossible? Many reasons. And I'll dive into them again here this evening. And I'll get into the other views of the tribulation, or the rapture rather, too. But many reasons, I believe, the post-trib view is impossible. Listen to this one. We'll close with this, and I'll pick back up the study later. Isaiah 65, verse 20 says... There shall no more be thence an infant of days, neither an old man that has not, lived, not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old. But the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. The child shall die an hundred years old. What this, what this scripture prophesies is a time coming in the future and it's, there's confusing things here. I'm not going to deny that, you know. It does speak about, hey, there's going to be a new heaven, a new earth. I don't think this is talking about the new heaven and new earth yet. I think this is in reference to 
the restored, you know, peaceful, ironclad rule of Christ on earth during the millennial kingdom, the thousand year period. During that period, Christ is going to rule, it says, with a rod of iron. And the Bible teaches, and I'll show you another one here that's really interesting this evening, Lord willing. I'll show you another scripture in Isaiah that talks about little kids playing with snakes. But, uh, and we ain't getting on, and we ain't becoming Pentecostals or something, or these, these strange, bizarre snake handling churches. But it's actually talking about kids playing with snakes. But in Isaiah 65, 20, it says that if a kid dies at 100, he's dying an infant. He's dying young. That's the young people that die, in other words. You know, nowadays, if somebody dies young, it was like a five-year-old. You're like, oh my goodness. They never live their life. They're five. You know? We don't want to die and we're 30, 40, 50 or whatever, you know? We don't want to die. We want more life. We want to live as long as we can. But when we look and we see a child die, we say, man, they didn't even get to start living. Well, you know what God says here? During that time, if you die 100, it's like dying when you're like five now. That's what that's saying. There's going to come a time when the youngest of the people live to be 100. Now, that's the oldest of people. But there's going to come a time when that's the youngest of people, they die at 100. Now, has that happened yet? No, it has not. Is that going to happen in the future? Absolutely, because the Word of God's inerrant. The Word of God's true. What it says that He will do. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing, and like I said, I'm closing with this thought. If the post-tribulational rapture view is true, then who goes into the millennial kingdom for this to be fulfilled? Because if every single believer at the very end of the tribulation period is transformed into a new body to never die again, who is dying in the millennial kingdom? Because unbelievers ain't there. Read Matthew 25. Who is dying in the millennial kingdom? Answer, there is not an answer. The post-trib view is impossible. That's one of the strongest, most simple arguments to show the post-tribulational rapture is totally impossible. But again, remember what I said earlier in the sermon? That's why I said it. I didn't waste my time saying it, I hope. you got to know the Bible to know these things, don't you? You see how to, to teach Revelation 20 and to Matthew 24 and to 1 Thessalonians 4 and to 2 Thessalonians 2, you got to go to Isaiah 65 to find one of the reasons. It's not easy, man. That's why people have to develop this. That's why it's the meat of the word. It's harder. It's, it's not easier. But you can get it. It's not impossible, I promise. And so we'll continue working our way through these things. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.